Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, debate program of the Researcher to Reader Conference, where we are going to be discussing uh, the issue of paid peer review. Um, those of you who have attended uh, Researcher to Reader in the past have experienced uh, our debate programs before. We're going to do it a little bit differently this time. Um, we have as our debaters uh, Professor Brad Fenwick, who is a senior vice president at Taylor and Francis. Dr. James Heathers, who's Chief Scientific Officer at CypherSkin and founder of the 450 Movement, Allison Muddit, who's the CEO of PLOS, and Dr. Tim Vines, who's a founder at DataSeer. Um, our debating team uh, will be addressing the proposition, journal publishers should pay academics for providing peer review. Uh, and Brad and James will be arguing in favor of the proposition while Allison and Tim will be arguing against it. Um, we're going to, un unlike uh, previous debate programs, we're going to divide this one into two sessions. So today we're going to hear the opening statements, which will be provided by Brad and Allison. Um, and those will be followed by a Q and a, a, Q and a period of Q&A. And then tomorrow, we'll have the responses from James and Tim, which will be followed by another Q&A. The entire debate is going to be bracketed by a vote. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take a vote of the audience and ask you to vote in favor of or against the proposition. We're going to take account of the audience vote. And then when the whole debate program is finished tomorrow, we're going to take the same vote again and we'll measure the number of votes that moved and declare a winning team based on, uh, based on the outcome. Uh, so with that, without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Brad for the opening statement in favor of the proposition. Brad? Thanks, Rick. Um, we're very pleased, uh, James and I, uh, to take on the challenge of standing in favor of the resolution that expert peer reviewers should be paid. We would extend that just a bit to say paid for their contribution to the quality and speed of the publication process. We'd note that our comments are not necessarily representative of our personal views or those of our employers or associate organizations. But we do view this as an opportunity to extend new considerations that will address the limitations of the current publishing process. And more importantly, will result in publications of higher quality in a timelier fashion. The positive trade-off between paying reviewers and any marginal additional costs strongly favors our position. The central question on Brad, which- Brad, I'm so sorry, I have to interrupt you. I, I completely forgot to call the poll. <laughs> All right. Ah, oh, my, my apologies. No, uh, that's Claire, let, let, we're, we're, we're competitive, so let's make sure we measure the results. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right, the, the poll is up. Uh, we're going to ask everybody to follow the directions on the screen and, uh, and submit their votes. And uh, while we're waiting for the votes to come in, I, I, will, I will also clarify that we are, uh, we are imposing strict time limits on the debaters, uh, except when we, uh, when we come back to Brad and invite him to start again, we will uh, make sure that, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that his time isn't, isn't uh, negatively affected by my mistake. I was so eager to get to the, to get to the, <laughs> the real program that I, completely forgot the important first part. No worries. We purposely kept our opening statement relatively brief just to get to questions and answers. So we should be okay. All right, Claire, I'll count on you to let me know when the, uh, when the voting is tailing off and, and it looks like it's ready to close it. All right, uh, the voting is closed and the initial vote is 41 are in favor of the proposition and 59 are against it. Claire, is that uh, raw votes or is that percentage? That's percentage, 41% of our voters are in favor, 59% are against. 
And uh, Claire, could you also give us the raw numbers if you can see them? 64 people in total. Okay, wonderful. All right, Brad, if I could right. ask you to start again, thanks so much for your patience. Well, I'll just jump to where I left off because okay, it great. is the central question. So the central question we have, and we believe that this debate rests is whether offering to pay peer reviewers will improve the quality of the public of what is published and that the process will be completed faster. And any additional marginal costs will be worth these important benefits. The other way to frame this question is whether it would be detrimental as the other team I'm surely will suggest. Yet the evidence does not support such a position beyond the fear of doing something innovative and new and perhaps slightly reducing the margins of publishers, which we would argue does not necessarily need to be the case. Over publication, the disproportionate production of scientific documents has been decried for at least 50 years. And during this time, very little has occurred to slow or reverse that trend. At present, the amount of academic publications doubles approximately every nine years. While this trend represents some good elements, such as increased publication rates in emerging economies, and some bad, such as ever-increasing expectations to produce peer-reviewed documents as a point of differentiation from market competition, the point inarguably remains that these manuscripts must be reviewed by someone and the quality of the review is a cornerstone of human progress. We think there can be no debate that expert peer reviewers should continue to provide their critical input and their work is an invaluable contribution that should be recognized in several ways. As we know, some expert peer reviewers currently do receive rewards and various forms of compensation for their efforts. These include, but are not limited to being recognized for their expertise, eventually serving on editorial boards or becoming an editor, all which are key indicators of social career advancement. Of special importance when they're in these positions is that they hold the advancement of their discipline in their hands. Simply put, these forms of compensation, while helpful, often fail to address the two biggest complaints with the peer review process. One, that the quality reviews provided are not as helpful as they might be, and the excessively long time it takes for a review to be completed. Efforts to address these limitations simply have not been successful. It is now time to try something innovative and different. This includes the potential of reviewers being paid by the publishers. The value of the knowledge and time expert peer reviewers should be fully recognized. In the case of academics, their financial, their institutional financial compensation often has not kept pace. In many cases, the circumstances of their employment simply does not allow compensation to increase. The difference between the salary of academics and employees of publishers drives this point home. As such, alternative sources income for academics have become an increasing priority. Universities recognize this fact and provide faculty with the freedom to supplement their income as paid consultants, and or by being involved in for-profit businesses. There's no reason that their contribution to the publishing industry should be treated in a lesser fashion. We have made the case that enhancing the quality of what is published and that it's done as quickly as possible should be the top priority. All other concerns are of secondary importance. Nevertheless, the mechanism as to how peer reviewers could be paid will briefly be addressed. Obviously, most likely in greater depth during the question and answer period and the second stage of this debate. 
paying for peer reviews creates a different expectation rather than asking for this to be done as a donation to the publisher. Some of the most highly recognized publications have paid employees that serve as internal reviewers. Treating external reviewers in the same fashion as they are already done in many cases for books, thesis, and statistical reviews is appropriate and fair. Plus some editors are well compensated for their efforts. So why would the same approach not be applied to peer reviewers? Publishers have margins and excess revenues that allow them to pay reviewers. The trade-off between paying reviewers and the quality and speed of the review would be reflected in the amount paid, even if it would cause a very minor increase in widely shared subscription prices or an increase in article processing charges or other fees paid by authors. To avoid antitrust issues, the amount paid to reviewers would be established by the market based on a number of criteria. Further, an author might be paid by the publisher through prepaying APCs or other fees that have equal or greater value to the authors. Would an author be willing to pay something to get helpful, get more helpful reviews or get their reviews in a few days rather than weeks or months? While there may be discipline specific influences, many would agree to pay at least a modest amount, which would reflect their priority. When these costs are widely distributed, the cost of the author, the publisher, or the customer would be at margins at best. When the benefit would flow, well, what benefits would flow for paying reviewers? Publishers would benefit directly by a quicker publication cycle and a reduction in the editorial effort that would more than compensate them for the cost of paying for the best peer reviewers. Editors would benefit directly by the discharge of a contract with both stipulations of quality and an expected time frame. They presently have few, if any, mechanisms to compel a review in the first place, and requests increasingly go unanswered. The record number of peer-reviewed invitations that we have heard requiring to compel a singular, single acceptance of a review is 41. Likewise, editors have no ability to compel a response from an absent or recalcitrant reviewer, but expecting times to review completion from both author and publisher are lower. A contract which provides an explicit exchange of value provides much needed certainty around the time frame, the quality, and the predictability of the reviews received. Authors would likewise benefit from the same characteristics of particular interest in an environment where short-term contracts of employment may last longer than the review process of a manuscript itself. The success of a search for a new employment are often predicated on previous manuscripts being accepted for publication. Whether a reviewer would find financial compensation could be optional, and the amount could depend on a number of reviews, performance and discipline specific considerations. Likewise, compensation could be directed elsewhere. For example, tenured faculty who consider themselves already paid to review would no doubt be delighted to direct the funds to support publication of manuscripts elsewhere within their institution or to a variety of bursaries or charitable causes. In summary, James and I believe that it's time for publishing to advance an additional step so that the quality of what is published is improved, that the process happens quicker and the additional cost is worth these important benefits. The most direct 
and promising means of accomplishing this and providing for the many positive trade-offs is an appropriately paid peer reviews for their critical expert contribution to the scientific publishing enterprise. Thanks very much, Brad. Um, we will now move to Allison Muddit from uh, PLOS who will offer the opening statement against the proposition. Allison? Great, thanks Rick. Um, so I'm pleased to be here to present the, uh, the opposing view from, from Tim and myself. Let me begin by saying that paying reviewers sounds like a great idea in the same way that everybody can get behind the idea of free cake. But paying reviewers is totally impractical and would have dramatic negative consequences for peer review. Sadly, that means that our statement is gonna be a bit of a downer, no free cake and no practical way to pay reviewers without wrecking peer review. There are so many problems, it's hard to know where to start, but let's go with the fee itself. Just like articles themselves, reviews vary wildly in length, quality and complexity. Where would we start with assessing an appropriate fee? Our fellow panelist, James Heathers, has famously started a movement calling for reviewers to be paid $450 for their reviewing offers. Why pick $450? Reviewers can ask for any amount they like. There are some articles so, that are so intricate that perhaps only a handful of experts on earth can review them. What are their review efforts worth? Take the going rate for expert witness testimony in a court case as a starting point. Anything less than $300 would be insulting. A single review of a long and complex article could then come in at $6,000. That's a lot of money. Even if the fee were a mere $100, significantly lower than our fellow panelists suggest, one large society publisher tells me that this would wipe out the surplus they return to the society. No surplus, no more investment in the society's research and researchers. Paying reviewers is completely impractical. Even the apparently minor task of determining the, determining the fee is a quagmire that neither publishers, editors, nor how that's defined and who gets to decide how much is too much, such a system would require publishers to build an entirely thousands of micropayments, a huge burden on any publisher, but especially smaller ones with tight margins. Clearly, having to pay reviewers would just lead publishers to raise their prices. They'd raise prices to cover the money they're paying reviewers, and they'd raise them again to cover the cost of making those payments. A movement focused on punishing big commercial publishers by forcing them to pay reviewers would thus lead big publishers to jacking their prices by 20 to 30%, certainly not the outcome anyone was after. Let's also try to quantify the direct costs. In an APC world, the authors of the accepted articles cover the costs of reviewing all those other articles that got rejected, for an open access journal with a 25% acceptance rate and an average of 2.2 reviews per article, paying each reviewer the recommended $450 would add $3,960 to each APC. And then of course, there's the spurious argument that publishers don't pay for peer review. In fact, they spend millions of dollars each year supporting the peer review process, taking on tasks that would require hours of effort from authors or reviewers. They pay for peer review management systems, stipends for journal editors, and internal editorial office teams. At PLOS alone, this costs us about $2.4 million each year. And those are just the direct costs without adding any management layers or necessary overheads such as office space, finance, and human resources. Dr. Heather's proposed $450 per review would have increased PLOS's costs on PLOS One alone in 2020 by over $30 million. Add in the other PLOS journals, and these fees would have more than doubled PLOS's entire cost base. Now let's look at other more fundamental impacts that paying reviewers would have on the integrity of the entire peer review system. First of all, 
Paying reviewers creates a number of new and problematic conflicts of interest for both the reviewer and the journal editor. This is particularly the case in an APC model where reviewers must be paid even if they reject an article, but the journal earns no revenue. As an editor, you would therefore want to find reviewers who'll accept an article so that you can recoup your costs through an APC. The prospect of a quick buck would also tempt some reviewers to comment on articles well outside their areas or to tell editors what they think they want to hear so they get hired again. We've already seen scandals caused by similar issues, especially when linked with fast track peer review. And even if we only applied a peer review fee to some subset of predetermined greedy publishers, surely we'd then be incenting reviewers to review for them rather than the good guys. Next, the academic reward system already has plenty of perverse and damaging incentives. Paying reviewers would add yet more. Review payments likely incent quick, non-detailed reports that don't serve the community well. It's quite possible we'd see the emergence of new review factories and a sharp spike in review fraud as there would now be double the benefit to these activities. And just as we're starting to see healthy and much needed experimentation with new forms of review, such as reviews of preprints, these would likely be killed as many academics would become reluctant to peer review for free. We're at a moment when we are increasingly aware of the deep inequities in the global research system. Paying reviewers would undermine our efforts to be more inclusive. We know that reviewers come mainly from the global north in spite of our efforts to change this. And so yet again, this is where the money would flow, further disadvantaging researchers in low and moderate income countries. If we charge authors for those review services via APCs, it will create yet another problematic transfer of funds in the wrong direction. Let's move to the academics themselves. Do they actually want to be paid? Studies show us that they view peer review as a service to their community, a quid pro quo of having your own work reviewed. Many reviewers also have a desire to help shape their fields and to get a sneak peek at new work before it's published. Acting as a reviewer thus has the characteristics of community service driven in part by altruism. We want to stress that there's a lot of research showing that altruistic behavior is quickly corroded into an ugly mess by the addition of financial incentives. Just Google the overjustification effect. We can't end by asking the obvious question, what problem is paying reviewers actually trying to solve? If it's anger at the scale of selected publishers profit, then there's a far simpler solution. Don't review for or publish in their journals. The most powerful action each of us has as consumer is where we choose to spend our time and resources. If I think that certain publishers are generating inflated profits based on my labor, I can simply choose not to give them my labor. We suspect that what's actually going on here is more complicated. When researchers call for payment for review, we might find that the majority are simply asking for recognition. Because we traditionally recognize work with pay, the demand is formed as a request for payment. So instead of getting into a mess trying to pay the money, we must work harder on rewarding reviewers with other currencies of academia, reputation, recognition, and success. Now we acknowledge that there are indeed many underpaid and overworked people in academia, especially among early career researchers. Paying them for peer review is not going to solve that deeper set of injustices. Let's tackle those injustices directly instead. So to sum up, on this short depressing journey, we've identified a swathe of problems with paying with peer reviewers, none of which, mind you, would be solved by limiting reviewer payments to large commercial publishers. First, reviewer fees are a bureaucratic nightmare. They will have to be negotiated with each reviewer, they require an entirely new micropayments infrastructure and will act as a massive additional drag on the efficiency of the peer review system. Second, paying reviewers is a waste of scarce resources. Publishers will just pass the costs along to libraries and authors, drawing additional money out of library budgets and granting agencies publication funds and putting a healthy percentage back into big publishers' profits. Third, bringing money into a into a system built on trust and altruism will be highly corrosive. Motivation will shift from professional duty to maximizing profit. 
and a whole new class of ethical infractions and conflicts of interest arise. Finally, paying reviewers doesn't actually address the real underlying problem. Researchers need proper re rewards for their reviewing efforts. Let's focus on addressing that instead of wasting a lot of time and money on the false promise of paying for peer review. All right, thanks so much to uh, uh, Brad and Allison for their excellent opening statements. Um, we are now going to pass into the discussion section. We've had a number of good questions come in. Um, the first one uh, is from Lindsay McCallum. She asks, isn't the key issue here that academics are doing free work for commercial publishers who make significant profits off this free labor? The effectiveness of peer review seems like a secondary issue regarding financial compensation. And I'll, I'll invite uh, any of the debaters who want to unmute and, and, and pipe up. You can go ahead and do that. If it becomes too chaotic, we will come up with a different system. But for now, I think everybody can probably just speak up. Tim, go ahead. Um, so I think we need to be a bit clearer about what journals are doing and what reviewers are doing. Journals manage peer review and reviewers review authors' papers and in return, they get their own papers reviewed. So there is a lot of quid pro quo in this system in that you, in, in return for your reviewing effort, you expect when you submit an article to a journal, that it will in turn get reviewed. And, and so the labor there is, is a passing back and forth of, of effort between academics with that system being managed by the journals. So it's not completely clear that the review is for the journals, it's also for the academics themselves. Just so happens to be centered within a commercial process where there's also wild disparities in how much money is made at any given point in time. I would also point out at this juncture that there is an increasing habit amongst senior authors not to review anything at all because they consider it to be a waste of their time. So the, all the discussions around altruism here are framed in terms of the fact that there are no consequences whatsoever from walking away from that altruism and that people do it all the time. It's also not something that's ever tracked. So we don't actually have any idea how bad that would be. And if the discussions around the frustrations that editors have trying to organize simple reviews in the first place, I have a friend who has a paper that hasn't been assigned review in seven months. Now, that seems like an extreme example until you realize that it isn't common. Um, I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for the framing here that is around, I am doing work for nothing within this context. And that is, it is completely out of proportion to any other industry when it comes to the length of time taken and the complexity of what's being offered. And there is no simple and immediate resolution of how something like this needs to be framed. It is very, very difficult. Um, the, a, a full scale system that requires everyone to pay for all the labor that they receive in every context, makes it almost impossible to start a tiny journal, unless of course you are relying on the altruism of people within a community, which is how they all start in the first instance. Um, there are layers and complexities within this. Um, our primary choice of this frame, and I think that Brad would agree with this, is looking past the idea that this is the inequity of the situation. And believe me, I will get to that tomorrow in no uncertain detail. But the fact that there is an unwieldiness that is growing and will continue to grow within how this is organized and the way that anything else that becomes a kind of tragedy of the commons argument in this context is generally handled is to price it. So the thrust of this has more in common with how carbon pricing or EPA regulations work on a kind of a macro level. But I'm, I'm, I'm entirely sympathetic towards discussions around why am I working for free as someone who receives no academic compensation uh, and, and uh, where uh, academic reward uh, in the recognition sense means nothing to me whatsoever. 
wonder if I could just jump, jump in and come back to the central point of the question that was asked, which was around um, the fact that reviewers aren't paid and publishers making large profits and just kind of poke a hole in that one. Um, I am certainly not going to stand here and defend the pro pro profits of any publisher, believe me. Um, you know, I'm a CEO of a moderate sized nonprofit and um, we operate in a very different uh, position. And I think I made that clear in, in, my, in the, our opening statement. The fact that paying peer reviewers would be a significant extra burden. Uh, the 450 that's been suggested by, by Dr. Heathers, as I said, would have more than doubled our entire cost base last year. Even $100 a review would be a significant burden for many pub publishers, especially the nonprofit publishers. So the idea that there's some sort of big bucket of money sloshing around at publishers that could pay for this is just completely unrealistic. Brad, did you have anything to add in response to that question? You no, not, not, not this time. I, I think everybody's framing it reasonably well. Um, what we try to do is draw the debate to what's the goal, not what's the process. We can come up with a thousand reasons why something's not workable, but if the goal of solving the underlying problem that everybody calls out that reviews often aren't helpful to the authors and it takes too long. Uh, that how we get there is the question. Um, and because it has not been solved yet. And as an editor, that's my biggest challenge. Uh, Tim, go ahead and then we'll move on to the next question. I think I, I want to pull up. Um, why would a, what's too long to take a review? I mean, two to three weeks for evaluating a piece of science is seems fair enough to me. It's difficult. You have to think hard about it. The harder you think about it, the the more insightful your review is going to be. And I think because of the importance of peer review for science, giving someone two or three or four weeks to evaluate a manuscript seems perfectly reasonable. And plus, I also want to challenge the idea that peer review is, is in this sort of chaotic mess. It's, it's just like public transit, that everybody has got a horror story of public transit that went completely wrong. The bus was so late, but they forget every other bus ride they took where the bus arrived on time and it took them to their destination on schedule and it was really cheap and it worked really well. And so I've watched a lot of peer review go under my nose, something like 15,000 manuscripts at this point in my life. And most of them went really well. We had great reviewers, great engagement. The comments were intelligent and the paper improved. There are times when it went completely wrong. Absolutely. But that's the product of doing something in such large numbers. All right. Thanks, Tim. Let's, let's go on to the next question. Um, this one is from Mark Carden, our our host and organizer, um, and he, he expresses the hope that one of the debaters is going to talk about the overjustification effect, um, which I quickly looked up on Wikipedia for the benefit of those who may not know what it is. And Wikipedia defines it this way, the overjustification effect occurs when an expected external incentive, such as money or prizes, decreases a person's intrinsic motivation to perform a task. Um, the overall effect of offering a reward for a previously unrewarded activity is a shift to extrinsic motivation and the undermining of pre-existing intrinsic motivation. Once rewards are no longer offered, interest in the activity is lost, prior intrinsic motivation does not return, and extrinsic rewards must be continuously offered as motivation to sustain the activity. Who would like to address that issue? I was going to joke, my husband's a social psychologist and he's in the next room if you want me to go and grab it. <laughs> <laughs> give you a whole lecture on it. I think Tim, Tim and I were talking about this, and I'll, I'll throw it to Tim in a minute. This was a point that came up as we, we've sort of been, as we were talking about the impact. So, you know, I, I hear the challenges and I totally agree with the challenges we're hearing from our opponents about the, some of the problems with peer review. And I don't think uh, Tim or I would stand here for a moment and suggest that there aren't problems with peer review, that it isn't a very inefficient system and that there aren't 
real changes that we should be making to to improve on that. And you know, we'll we'll get to some of those um, tomorrow, hopefully as well. Uh, but I think the idea of introducing money into the system. We've seen what happens just with APCs and some of the challenges there with predatory journals and suddenly there's a payment that everybody can get to. We talked a little bit uh, in um, our opening statement about the challenges that we've seen when there is payment for fast track. And I think one of the real worries here as well is creating a two tier system where those who can afford to get their fast review get a fast review and everybody else is left at the back of the line. So I, I think there are, you know, a number of unintended consequences that money introduces. And Tim, I'll find out if there's anything you'd like to add. I think the, um, if we switch to a payment for peer review, then people will, as we pointed out, some people will be able to charge an extraordinary amount for a review um, because they are the only experts who can review an article. And then when they return a five line review saying this is fundamentally flawed because X, then the authors will be very aggrieved that they have had to pay so much money for such a short review, even though the person that provided it was, you know, uniquely expert and able to do that. And so it just, it makes these simple transactions of this manuscript is completely flawed. It turns it into a fraught, um, conflicted situation for everyone involved. So. Um, so yeah, you've, you've just made the assumption that money is going to be handed out on a contractual basis where there are no enforceable conditions. If you are paying a large amount of money for a review of a certain quality, even the fact that it's five lines in the first place would be in violation of any conceivable ability to pay someone to do a task. I hire consultants all the time. And if that was the response that I got, I would terminate the agreement that I had with the consultants uh, said, we need to have a mutual agreement about what happens when I pay you. Um, there's, there's, there's been a few presuppositions here and elsewhere about how this works. So that somehow the idea that when, when a contract is drawn up in the first instance, suddenly it doesn't have any conditions. People are free to return five line reviews now because there are no consequences whatsoever. And what we're actually doing is proposing a consequence in that circumstance. Um, with regards to the over-justification effect, um, that's usually framed. I mean, I have very little faith in a lot of large ideas within social psychology, and you can read about the 20 years worth of fights. Um, and of course, the, the history of the replication crisis in the last 10 years, and see if you can map that on top of how the over-justification effect of research is doing. But I'd simply add in this point that you're also adding extrinsic motivation at the same time that you may be potentially reducing intrinsic motivation. Um, and again, that you are operating under conditions that are enforceable by a brief, uh, it would have to be, agreement that is legally binding. Um, for, for, for 50, uh, the first contract that I drew up, I should add, of course, that publishers are very unwilling to pay this money. The first contract that I drew up has very strict conditions for me. Um, if, if, someone, if someone does agree to give me money for a year, um, I have a short time frame. I have an expectation of quality and the, and the editor, I am giving them veto power. I would expect any other contract in this situation to work exactly the same way, maybe even more stringent than what I previously imagined. It seems to me that we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole of only one innovative, one idea. I would like to think there are many other creative ideas in terms of being able to do this. Um, mentioned the APCs when they were first raised. Oh, it was unworkable. It would destroy publishing. Obviously, that hasn't happened. It's been a challenge, and a lot of innovative, creative things have emerged. You certainly could do this if you want to get to mechanics of doing it up front in sort of a contractual way. You could also do it as a, re a reward. Um, you know, uh, um, and we see that in other industries. Uh, where somebody provides an excellent review in a, an appropriate time frame, and you reach out and say thank you for that, and in, and because of that, um, we're going to provide some additional compensation in you know to recognize your special efforts. If they don't meet those expectations, then the reward doesn't follow. So it essentially helps drive behavior, and I think it undermines the argument that 
once you start paying, you always have to continue to pay. It sort of reminds me in that type of framework, more like a, a tip where somebody gives you special service in a timely fashion and you financially recognize that by rewarding them for that behavior, that, that, that point. I'm not saying that's the right way to do it. I'm just saying that there are options as opposed to closing the door and saying it's too hard to contemplate. Brad, thanks so much. And thanks so much to all of you. I'm afraid we do have to end the session now so that everyone can get to their workshops. We've had many more questions than we've had time to address here. So I hope that uh, our attendees will join our debaters uh, in the virtual networking session in the Great Hall at uh, 520 today. Um, and for right now, I just want to invite everyone to please take a moment to rate and comment on this session in our participant survey. Um, I want to thank so much uh, Allison and Brad and Tim and James for their excellent opening statements and discussion. I'm really looking forward to the responses and further Q&A tomorrow. Uh, for now, uh, next up is the workshops. Please rejoin the workshop in which you have been participating up until now. Um, please stick to the workshop you were assigned to. If, if you haven't already joined or if you haven't been assigned to a workshop, then please join workshops B, C, or E as the other two are completely full. And of course you join by going to your workshops agenda item on the timeline. And then you'll see in the session information box, a link to the virtual rooms, which is uh, the workshop venue. Um, when you're in the virtual rooms area, then just look for the room for your workshop, which is lifted, listed on the left side of the screen and go to the first of those rooms. I know it does sound complicated, but think about how much harder it is to find your way around the BMA house. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll thank everyone again. Thank you for, uh, thank you and the audience for your participation and we'll move to the workshops. Thanks all. <laughs>